Hello, professional nurses. This is Mrs. Ignacio, and this is your mental health huddle. We are going to go just drinking from a fire hose of knowledge on all things mental health to kind of give you a great overview. And for those of you who are visual learners, I'm going to be using my pictorials. So I did send you the link to Dean's Corner, and this is under the Fortis Comprehensive Google Classroom. And you have access to all of these visual aids to help you out, okay? So when we talk about mental health, I want you to think about that mental health assessment. I want you to think about mental health being a state of well-being, and each individual is able to realize their own potential and how we cope with our normal stresses of life, of work, right? Are we fruitful? How we contribute to the community? These are all things to keep in mind when we talk about mental health. Now, when we talk about mental illness, these are all of the mental disorders that have definable diagnosis, right? And we are using uh, the guide, the DSM, okay? The DSM is going to be the guide that we use. Now, you may be thinking, okay, I'm not a psychiatrist, but there is a field of mental health nursing. And I will tell you that your med surge patient, your mother baby patient, uh, any patient that you have can become a mental health patient within the drop of a dime, okay? So you just really need to understand that. At the basis of our mental health is going to be Abraham Maslow. And uh, I know that you're studying that with fundamentals and with your med surge. And when I think Maslow, I think physiological needs, I have to meet those needs first, safety and security, love and belonging, self-esteem and self-actualization. And I should bring up a picture of Maslow so you can kind of see it because that's going to be important because not only is that the basis of mental mental health, but that's also the basis of what we do uh, when we are prioritizing. So you definitely will see Maslow again and again. Now, the test questions will never say uh, in accordance with Maslow, but it will mention priority. So let me just bring Maslow in front of you for a second. So again, physiological safety, love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. I had a nursing student tell me at one point, the acronym that she used or the phrase that she used to remember uh, the, the different layers of this pyramid. And it's pink scarves belong everywhere, so accessorize. So that was perfect for me because pink is my favorite color, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, pink scarves belong everywhere, so accessorize. P is for physiological, scarves is for safety, belong, right, is for belonging, and everywhere is for esteem, and so accessorize is self-actualization. All right, so I just wanted to make sure that you understand Maslow as the basis of what we do, and let's jump into our first condition. We're talking about alcohol withdrawal delirium. Some of the things that you need to know associated with this DTs is going to be CWA protocol. That is C-I-W-A. If you are not familiar with the CWA protocol, you will. Um, if you're not sure, please look it up, but it is actually a checklist in which we perform this assessment on the patient every four hours, see if they have headache, nausea, if they have any uh, dizziness, do they have any uh, hallucinations, right? And in this picture, you see the individual, the patient is having tactile hallucinations. And you're like, what are tactile hallucinations? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that, but just to let you know that patients, uh, we have five senses and we can have hallucinations with all of our five senses. And that may seem really unusual, but it's true. So with the sense of touch, tactile hallucinations, we feel things, sensations that are actually not there. With hallucinations, we are responding to internal stimuli. It's not external stimuli. 
So when we think about our patient with uh, DTs, uh, this can be your med surge patient that has been NPO for 24 hours because they're going in for surgery. What you're going to see is this patient has a history of drinking alcohol. And uh, because they haven't had any alcohol, they're going to start shaking. They could be vomiting. They can have an elevated pulse, elevated blood pressure and temperature. They may also be very sweaty, right? Diaphoretic. So this is going to be important to watch out for, and that's why one of the questions we ask our patients is, how often do you drink alcohol if you drink at all? So we have to carefully monitor these, this patient, and he will be or she will be prescribed medication to deal with the symptoms, okay? All right, so those are alcohol DTs, alcohol withdrawal, and understand the CWA protocol. All right, let's talk about alterations of body image. So here we have an amputee. And so this could be not only an amputee, this could be a patient that has to have a mastectomy, have a breast removed, or uh, someone that has been disfigured for some reason because of some kind of trauma. I want you to remember Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her stages of grief and loss. So when we think about it, uh, the acronym that I use is DABDA, D-A-B-D-A. -A. So denial, anger, bargaining, oh, DAB, D-A-B, hold on, I totally had a mental lapse. Hold on, let me write it down, DAB. Yeah, so denial, acceptance, bargaining, depression, Okay, I'm sorry, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. Okay, so denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Okay, so denial, no, this is not happening. No, I don't have this diagnosis. You may see questions surrounding that. You, um, I've seen questions where the patient has was told they have a terminal illness and they say, okay, well, I'm planning for my vacation next summer. So they are in denial of the fact that the doctor told them they have a very serious condition. Anger, they can lash out at healthcare providers. They can be angry at God, right? Bargaining, they can say, God, if you cure me of this illness, I will always go to church or, you know, I'm trying to make a deal with God. Okay. Depression, they can, you know, be very sad, lethargic, weight loss, overeating, all of the things that go along with depression. And then lastly is adjustment or acceptance. Okay, I have this condition. Uh, I have to deal with it. I have to move on and cope the best that I can. So this is um, not only dealing with body image, it's also with grief and loss. It could be the death of a lo loved one or the patient knows that they have a terminal illness right? So these are all things to think about and how the patient will process their particular condition. If we know a loved one has a terminal illness, there's something that's called anticipatory grief, and the individuals and the family may already start grieving while the loved one is still alive because they know the loss is imminent. So your role as the nurse is to try to provide support and meet the needs of this family. All right, let's talk about anorexia. So I love this picture because it's definitely worth a thousand words. So when we think about anorexia, anorexia nervosa, it is an eating disorder characterized by an extreme fear of gaining weight and they have an altered perception of their own body weight. So the, the patient will see themselves as fat. They have a preoccupation with thoughts of food. They judge themselves by their self-worth, right, based on their body weight. And that's pretty tough uh, right now because in society, there's an emphasis placed on being a, a certain body type, a certain body shape. There's a lot of body shaming. So this is really something to look out for, uh, especially in your teenage, uh, your female teenagers. These uh, anorexic patients also may ha have a low body weight, amenorrhea, so they're without a menstrual cycle. And think about it, if they don't have enough uh, nutrients, right, adequate nutrition, the, when we have our menstrual cycle, the body's saying, hey, I can support a developing fetus. Well, if this patient is anorexic, they can barely support their own uh, metabolic 
uh, processes and functions. So they definitely cannot support a developing fetus. And so they will have amenorrhea. They will not have a menstrual cycle. They can also have cold extremities, constipation, hypotension, bradycardia, impaired renal function, and hypokalemia. Well, what are your nursing interventions for this anorexic patient? Well, you want to develop a supporting relationship with the patient, monitor their fluid and electrolytes, their fluid uh, and food intake. You want to set achievable weight goals, and you want to limit their exercise regimen to promote weight gain. You want to also explore the client's feelings of self-worth, help them uh, adapt effective coping strategies, uh, make sure that you are encouraging family support groups, right? Because once they leave our presence, they still have to live with their families and go on with their lives. So maybe antidepressants will be prescribed for this patient. And we also want to provide positive reinforcement for weight gain. One of the best things that we can tell this anorexic patient is that think of food as fuel for your body. Okay, so think of food as fuel for your body. All right, let's take a look at this. When we think about our, especially our geriatric patients, we want to use this acronym, Judgment, Affect, Memory, Cognition, and Orientation. That will help you to assess your cognitive changes in dementia, right, in your dementia patients. When we think about dementia patients, we think about possible memory issues, and we think about cognitive decline. We think about them uh, not being able to carry out their ADLs, their activities of daily living, right? And so we have to understand that if a patient has dementia, their judgment may be off. Uh, here's an example. They may not really know that, okay, it's 30 degrees outside. I need to put on my winter coat. They may go outside in their Daisy Dukes, right? So we have to think about that. And safety is going to be one of the primary concerns with this kind of patient. Um, affect is their mood, right? How are they expressing their emotions? Memory, do they have memory? Now we know with our dementia patients, uh, they have issues with processing and keeping their short-term memories. So they may be stuck in the past. And cognition, are they aware of their surroundings, okay? And then orientation, are they, do they know who they are? Do they know what time of the day it is? Do they know why they're in a particular facility or healthcare setting, right? So all of these things are things that we have to think about with our dementia patients. All right, so the psych assessment, there's a lot going on with the psych assessment. So when we are performing this assessment, we have to be very comprehensive, very holistic. There's a lot of things that's going on in this particular picture. So you want to get the general history of the patient. What is their occupation? Of course, you're gonna start with their name, their ethnicity, their marital status, their living arrangements, right? Um, what kind of cultural implications or religious concerns that may impact their care. And you want to find out what is the presenting problem? What brings the patient to your office today? Or why is the patient hospitalized today? Are they seeking help voluntarily or were they made to come in, right? We have to, to determine that because that might determine how successful this treatment plan may be. If they're willing to cooperate, if they're open, they have a willingness to change or willingness to learn um, and be cooperative with their treatment, then it will probably have a better outcome. Okay, was it something that happened? Maybe there was a suicidal attempt or suicidal ideation. So we have to understand why the patient is there with us. Also, let's talk about their relevant personal history. Do they use substances? Have they had any previous hospitalizations? Has this kind of issue happened before, right? Um, do they have real healthy relationships? Are they in abusive relationships? Those are all relevant personal history kind of items. Also looking at family history, uh, looking at their childhood, looking at, okay, do they have a history of abuse? Um, 
Do they have a family history of mental illness? All of those things are going to be extremely important when we are performing our psych assessment. All right, we're going to go to the next one, bipolar disorder. So whenever I uh, talk about mental health and I talk about bipolar, I always bring up Kanye West. Uh, he has come forward and he definitely uh, has stated that he suffers from mental illness, right? And not to pick on him, but to use him as an example of someone that does have mental illness, but is extremely talented, extremely gifted in his particular area. Uh, of music and entertaining, right? So we know that even though people have mental health issues, they can still be very successful. Now, we know that Kanye had a little bit of difficulties. I think that's why his marriage did not work out. But um, nonetheless, I use him as an example of bipolar disorder. So the definition of bipolar disorder, we have bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. So bipolar is a mood disorder that is characterized by at least one week-long manic episode. So manic episodes may alternate with depression, right? And bipolar 2, low-level mania alternates with profound depression. So I'm going to tell you, we did a clinical one time and there was a patient that was in his manic phase. He was found on the campus of Norfolk State and he was having these rapid pressured speech. He was, um, you know, having grandiose thoughts and he said he knew the president of the university. He, you know, used to be the president of the university. Uh, just it was just really unbelievable. Right. So what you're going to see in this patient with mania, they have this inflated sense of self-importance, extreme energy, excessive talking with pressured speech. And so here's the thing that's also a little dangerous indiscriminate spending, reckless sexual encounters, and risky investments. So one of the things as far as our nursing interventions that we tell our patients that have bipolar is when they're in their manic phase, do not sign any contracts, right? Uh, do not make any large purchases uh, because they really are not um, able to think clearly. Their judgment is actually impaired. Okay, so uh, also, if you find your manic patient that is in a sexually compromising situation, if you see those uh, questions on your exams, you want to provide, uh, protect the patient's dignity as much as possible. Don't, you know, embarrass them, make sure that they're safe and escort them back to their room. That's going to be very important because sometimes these patients, they get uh, into this manic phase, they can become sexually promiscuous. Uh, and it can be really uh, quite surprising. Okay, and so uh, here you see in this picture, um, it's, it's kind of funny because I do again think of Kanye, it says vote for me for president. So I feel like when Kanye went out and he spent millions of dollars on that, you know, campaign, he was in that kind of manic phase of, hey, vote for me. Right now, on the flip side, this patient can be depressed. So whenever we have a patient that's depressed, our one of our number one concerns is going to be suicide, right? Suicidal ideation or suicide attempt. So let's quickly just mention suicide uh, precautions. That patient will be not left alone. They will have to eat with plastic utensils. Uh, they will be monitored and documented every 15 minutes, right? Because we really want to make sure that that patient stays safe. Now for bipolar disorder, the medication of choice is going to be lithium, right? Lithium is a mood stabilizer. You have to know that 1.5 and above that lithium level represents lithium toxicity. Lithium toxicity is, uh, can be fatal, right? So when a patient is taking lithium, we have to make sure that we are frequently monitoring their serum lithium. If the patient becomes dehydrated, that increases their risk of lithium toxicity. Okay, so but remember 1.5 is uh, going to be the, the rate of lithium toxicity. Other medications your bipolar patient can take or, or be prescribed is anticonvulsants, specifically valproic acid. 
And they also may be pre prescribed atypical antipsychotics, okay? Um, they may also be uh, prescribed anti-anxiety agents. All right, let's continue on. There's a lot to cover. All right, so here is your bulimic patient. So it's bulimia nervosa. Okay, so this is another eating disorder. We already talked about anorexia nervosa. And so this is quite interesting, your bulimic patient, right? So this picture kind of tells you what's going on with this patient. Now, bulimia is an uncontrollable compulsion to consume large amounts of food and a short period of time, and that is called binge eating. And this is usually followed by a compensatory need to rid the body of calories consumed. So that's why we're seeing the purging, the vomiting, the laxatives, maybe excessive exercise. So purging, the client uses self-induced vomiting, laxatives, diuretics, and enemas to lose or maintain weight. Non-purging ways that the client may control their weight is um, they may use excessive exercise. So how does this patient present? with bulimia. They may have bradycardia, hypotension, electrolyte imbalances, erosion of the teeth. Erosion of the teeth because they are sticking their fingers, right, to the back of their throat, and they may have scarring on their knuckles to make themselves vomit. We know that our stomach contents are very acidic, a pH of one to four. So if they have this vomiting, their teeth are going to be affected. A lot of times the dentist is going to be the first one that suspects a patient has bulimia because they're going to see that the enamel is actually worn away. Okay, the patient may also present with esophageal tear tears from vomiting, right? All of that acid can damage the esophagus. And this patient, unlike the anorexic patient, may be of a normal body weight, okay? They will also uh, present with muscle weakening. And again, we already talked about the scars or the calluses on their knuckles from their self-induced vomiting. So what is the role of the nurse for this patient? Well, we want to, again, develop a supportive relationship with the patient, monitor their electrolytes and their vital signs. If you see a question that talks about lab values, whenever you're concerned about a patient's weight or nutritional status, albumin is going to be one of the ones that you want to focus on because albumin is a measure of protein. It tells us if our patient is well nutritioned or not. All right, we are also going to monitor this patient 30 to 60 minutes after a meal because what happens? They eat and they go back to their rooms and they, they purge, right? So we really have to monitor that patient uh, right after eating. Don't leave them alone. Monitor their exercise regimen to make sure that they're not performing excessive exercise. Look out for teeth erosion and dental caries. Look out in the room if they have hoarding right? Are they hoarding any food? Encourage family support groups, and we will administer antidepressants as prescribed. All right, let's jump now into child abuse. We are mandatory reporters of child abuse and elder abuse. Abuse can happen and manifest itself in different ways. This picture uh, shows you a lot of the different manifestations. And abuse is not just, when we talk about our pediatric and our geriatric patients, there's physical abuse, right? Physical pain, bodily harm. We see these bites choking, right? But there's also sexual abuse, sexual contact that is inappropriate, right? Or, um, exposure to certain contact, right? Those are all forms of sexual abuse. Emotional abuse is mental anguish, threats, intimidating. Neglect is also a form of abuse. It could be physical, emotional, and it's failure to meet the needs. So if this child doesn't have what they need, like food, clothing, shelter, those security items, that is neglect. And the same goes for your geriatric patients. Economic abuse, and that is withholding financial support or illegal use of funds for personal gain. So if the parent receives uh, a check for the child and does not use the check to, you know, uh, 
buy things that the child needs. They use it to go get their hair done or their nails done. And the child doesn't have food and the child doesn't have the supplies to go to school. That is abuse. All right. And so when you see these questions on abuse, you are not going to be judgmental. You are going to report things in a matter of a fact way. Okay. A matter of a fact way. Okay, um, you could see test questions on um, the injuries. Spiral fractures is one of the main things that we see with abuse. And also, uh, um, the injuries do not match the story. Okay, the injuries do not match the story. So if little Johnny says, I fell off my bicycle, and he has multiple bruises of unequal healing, that's not consistent with just falling off their bicycle. If they fell off their bicycle, I would expect a knee to be scraped and elbow, but not multiple bruises all over their body of unequal healing. Okay. All right, let's talk about cocaine and crack users, okay? So we know that cocaine is a stimulant and it uh, falls under uh, addictive behavior, addictive disorders. And whenever I think of cocaine, I think of the movie Scarface and I think of Tony Montana, right? I just, I just do. So when we think about, you know, cocaine, crack, I think about drugs, um, I think about amphetamines as well, and methamphetamines, because they are all central nervous system stimulants. When this patient is intoxicated, they're going to be experiencing tachycardia, dilated pupils, elevated blood pressure, grandiosity, impaired judgment, paranoia with delusions. And that one scene, if you've seen the movie Scarface, he's standing there with his rifle. He's like, uh, I'm Tony Montana. Say hello to my little friend. And he's like, you know, getting ready to take over the world. He is high on cocaine. Okay. Now, when these crack cocaine, um, these patients that are using these central nervous system stimulants, when they go through withdrawal, right, they can experience fatigue, depression, agitation, apathy, anxiety, craving, and increased appetite. Okay, so this is definitely something that we need to be aware of. So since I'm talking about addiction, let's just talk about opioids, uh, opiates as well. So when we talk about opiates and we talk about addiction, we're thinking about heroin, we're thinking about fentanyl, we're thinking about hydromorphone, right? And so intoxication with these opiates, they're going to have constricted pupils, decreased respirations, decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, initial euphoria, followed by a dysphoria. So when this patient has withdrawal from opiates, they can have yawning, insomnia, panic, diaphoresis, cramps, nausea, vomiting, chills, fever, diarrhea. What do we do as nurses for these patients that have these addictive disorders? Well, we got to monitor their vital signs, assess for dehydration, assess for feelings of self-worth, make sure that they're safe. We will monitor their toxicology screen reports, right? We're looking out for withdrawal syndrome. Uh, we want to assess for overdose. And we know for opiates, we're going to administer naloxone or Narcan, right? We also want to assess the family members for codependency. We want to provide the patient with information about 12-step program, like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. They also have Al-Anon and al -Ateen. al -Anon is for the family members of substance abusers, and al is for teenagers. And I will tell you, those meetings are really um, a great support. It's confidential. A lot of the meetings are held in churches, and there's no questions asked. And what happens in those meetings stays in those meetings. Um, so let's continue on. Dementia. So again, another great reminder of things that we have to look out for our dementia patient. 
And when we are having patients with dementia, we have to make sure that we know the difference between delirium and dementia. So let's mention that briefly uh, as you also check out this pictorial. So delirium is characterized by a disturbance of consciousness and a change in cognition that develops over a short period of time. So it's a, a sudden onset. Dementia, however, is a progressive deterioration of cognitive functioning and global impairment uh, of intellect with no change in consciousness. So how would this look in a question? Family members ask the nurse, when will grandma come home? Well, and, and when will grandma be her normal self again? Well, unfortunately, the nurse has to respond with a, a response, something along the lines that dementia is a progressive degenerative condition and grandma will not be restored to her original state. Now, if a patient has delirium, right, delirium can be reversed as long as we determine what the underlying cause is. What are some of the possibilities? Well, it could be fever, hypotension, infection, hypoglycemia, an adverse drug reaction, head injury, emotional stress, or even seizure that causes your patient to become delirious, okay? So understanding dementia versus delirium is going to be a big NCLEX item. All right, so we have a depression assessment. So these are some of the questions we will ask our patient uh, that we suspect is depressed. How is their sleep, right? Are they able to sleep throughout the night or maybe they have insomnia or maybe they have hypersomnia, they could be sleeping too much. Do they have an increased or decreased in sexual activities? Do they have feelings of guilt, right? So in the Uvalde situation that happened in Texas, I can guarantee you that some of those children probably have these guilty feelings of why, what happened to my friend and how come I was able to survive, right? So we have to look at those kinds of examples. When we think about E, energy is going to be decreased, right? Also, they will have decreased ability to concentrate. They can have increase or decrease in their appetite, so that could lead to weight loss or weight gain. Also, psychomotor function decreases, and they may have, of course, suicidal ideations where they have these thoughts, and then even maybe suicidal attempts, okay? So this is a very, very, very busy pictorial. So this is uh, important for your depressed patient. There's many reasons why a patient may be depressed. Uh, the at-risk group, you need to definitely know who are patients that are high risk. The sad person's scale uh, is one of the screening tools that we use to assess depression, right? Um, if you see a question and it's a geriatric patient, you will always want to use the geriatric depressive scale, right? That is specific for the geriatric patient, okay? Because they are a specialized patient population. And depression can happen at any, any age, okay? At any age. The, uh, besides the geriatric population, our adolescents are at great risks. What will you see uh, as far as a test question, well, a teenager says, uh, these children don't like me and I don't like them either. Well, that's an alarming statement and that's going to require further investigation because that tells me that, okay, this could turn into a negative situation very quickly, right? So I have seen that and the other choices were like the teenager said, I have these bumps on my face, I feel self-conscious or my body's changing and I don't understand. Like, but those are normal things that you would expect a teenager to say. But if they say something about they don't like me, I don't like them, you know, you get this feeling of um, isolation. That's definitely a red flag. All right. 
So here's just uh, another slide on eating disorders. We talked about anorexia and bulimia, but let's talk about pica. Pica is very interesting because this patient that has pica has a craving or an urge to eat things that are not foods. Uh, and this could be very dangerous, right? Because we're talking about clay, laundry chips, soil, things that can actually uh, you know, be harmful to them. So we definitely uh, want to monitor this and make sure we try to keep the patient safe. And sometimes pica is associated with iron and zinc deficiency. All right, let's continue. So the five A's of Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia in older adults. It's marked by impaired memory and thinking skills. So this disease is classified into three stages. So the stage one is mild, stage two is moderate, stage three is severe. Okay, so there's some medications that patients that have Alzheimer's may take. It's not a cure, but it's just meant to slow the progression of the disease. So they may be prescribed cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, they may be prescribed SSRIs or anti-anxiety agents. The big thing to understand as far as a nurse caring for an Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's patient is we have to evaluate their level of cognitive and daily functioning. As you can see in this picture, this patient is not functioning very well, right? We have to identify threats to their safety, review all medications that they're taking, use short, simple words and phrases, speak slowly. That's something that I would have to definitely pay attention to because I know that I talk fast a lot of the times, but speaking slowly so they have time to process what you're saying. Explore how well the family understands the disease progression and review resources available to the family and maintain a consistent routine. So what does that mean? If you see this in a question, this patient that has Alzheimer's, not that they're going to have the same nurse every day because nurses don't work 24 hours uh, a day, but we want to keep the assignment as consistent as possible. So that's not anything that the patient has to uh, you know, adapt to because they won't be able to adapt very well to change. So these words that you see on the slide, anomia, apraxia, agnosia, nausea and amnesia and aphasia, you need to know those words, okay? You need to know those words for your mental health class and for NCLEX. All right, let's continue. So this is a great slide because this is something that can be confused, right? And you have to know what these terms mean as well. Hallucinations, illusions and delusions. Hallucinations, think about our five senses. There are sensory impressions, right, without external stimuli. So the patient is responding to internal stimuli. I see it almost every day as I see these, uh, the panhandlers, those people that have the signs that say that they're homeless or they need food, right? A lot of times you will see them and they are talking to themselves, right? They are responding to internal stimuli, okay? And so again, all of our five senses, we can have hallucinations. So we can have olfactory, our sense of smell, gustatory, our sense of taste, um, tactile, our sense of touch, auditory hallucinations, and even visual hallucinations. So our five senses, we can have those hallucinations, okay? Um, the big thing when you have a patient that has hallucinations, you have to understand and ask the patient, I understand and say, you don't confront them, but you say, Mrs. Smith, I understand that you are hearing voices. It must be frightening. What are the voices telling you? Because you really got to understand, are the voices telling her to dance around and pick flowers or the voices telling her to, you know, chop off everybody's head that's in the room? So that's going to be very, very important for you to understand what the voices are telling her. 
All right, so that's hallucinations, illusions. So real stimuli is misinterpreted. So we see this a lot, like in movies, someone's holding up a cell phone and it's like, oh, they're trying to attack me, right? They have a knife, right? So that's illusions. Delusions, wow. This is a false fixed belief. A lot of times this is um, religiosity. I've seen patients in the mental health setting where you could not tell them that they were not Jesus, right? In this picture, the patient says that she is Cleopatra. So whenever a patient has these fixed false beliefs, don't argue with them, but also don't contribute to uh, you know, what they're saying. You just, uh, whenever a patient has any hallucinations, illusions, delusions, you really want to choose the answer that says, I don't see anything, but I understand that you are experiencing something and it must be frightening, right? Those are the kind of ways that you should, you know, respond. And those are the answer choices that you should choose uh, when you see something like that. And of course, safety is going to be very important. Okay, um, one second. All right, so here we are with our next slide, and this is manic attack. So this is a patient that is in mania, right? So dig fast is one of the acronyms we can see. They're distractible. They will have indiscretion. They're not using their best judgment. They will have feelings of grandiosity flight of ideas, they're just, you know, from one topic to the next, activity increase, sleep deficit, and talkativeness. This is a patient that is in the manic phase that we are afraid of cardiovascular collapse, okay? Cardiovascular collapse is going to be something that we are very concerned about. So this is a patient that we will give finger foods. This is a patient that we will let take naps. Okay, usually we don't let our patients take naps, but the manic patient, we want them to take naps because we're concerned about cardiovascular collapse. Okay. All right. So the three R's in working with mental disability. So we want the patient to have routine, repetition, reinforcement, and on and on and on, right? So that's going to be very important with working with our mental health patients. All right, let's talk about obsessive compulsive disorder, okay? Obsessive compulsive disorder. So this patient will have obsessions and they will have compulsions. So the obsessions, these are intrusive thoughts that they just can't get out of their mind, right? So they, they have to perform these acts, which are compulsions. Because I am concerned about germs, I will continue to wash my hands. I will wash my hands 10 times every hour, right? All right, so um, we have these patients with these obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, something that goes along with this, this is a patient that you can't rush. You have to give them time to perform their actions, their compulsions, their rituals. But what you can do is try to delay uh, you know, what they do, but you can't stop them from doing it because it's actually gonna make their anxiety even worse. Okay, so when we think about uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, I also want to include phobias, panic, generalized anxiety disorder, and separation anxiety disorder. So phobias are persistent irrational fears of a specific object, activity, and panic. Um, we think about sudden onset of extreme apprehension or fear. Generalized anxiety is excessive anxiety or worry about numerous situations. And then separation anxiety, we usually link that with children, right, when they're in a daycare setting, but it could continue on into adulthood. So those are, uh, you know, um, an, an adult separation anxiety kind of scenario. Those are the ones that, hey, they text their boyfriend or girlfriend 20 times in the past hour. Why didn't you respond to my text? And then they stand by the car outside like, I was waiting for you. Where were you, right? I was looking for you, right? So those are the kinds of things that you can see um, related to these obsessive compulsive disorder. And actually hoarding is also another 
uh, obsessive compulsive kind of disorder. Okay, so for this patient that has obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, they may be on antidepressants, they may be on anti anxiety medications or anti convulsants. Okay. So this slide here just talks about the psych assessment, and it was kind of similar to one that we have seen before. So I'm just going to go to the next one. When we think about the psychiatric assessment, of course, we want to look at the appearance, their speech. Is it garbled? Is it slurred? Are they using a word salad? How's their memory, their mood? What are their thoughts, their perception, and their orientation? How do they perceive reality? All right, so here's a great um, one on the three R's, another three R's, re recognition, relationship, and resources or referral. So something to think about with our mental health patients is that when they have these mental illnesses, they usually have combination therapy, which consists of a medication regimen and group counseling or individual counseling. That's going to be really, really important. So we have to make sure that we educate the patient on this kind of combination therapy. It's not just, okay, you take these pills and you're going to be okay. They have to have some kind of counseling, some kind of support system. All right, let's get into schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a complex brain disorder that affects thinking, language, emotions, social behavior, and the ability to perceive reality correctly. When we look at this person that has schizophrenia, we have to understand that when we assess them, there's positive and negative symptoms. Positive symptoms is the presence of something that is not normally present, such as alterations in their thought, alterations in their speech. They can have word salad. They can have echolalia, which they will actually be repeating what you're saying. Um, uh, they can also have alterations in their perception, which can include hallucinations, um, and they can have, um, you know, all of the five senses can, they can have these hallucinations. And that is all positive symptoms. Something is present that shouldn't be. Now, negative sy symptoms is going to be the reference to the absence of something that should be present. So they should have you know, emotions, but they're actually going to present with a flat affect or a blunted affect, meaning that they're not going to have any emotional response, right? Maybe even robotic. You can see that they could be sometimes at a catatonic state, just staring. They could be um, in a position and, you know, kind of a weird position, just frozen. I think of the mannequin challenge that was many years ago before COVID. We had this mannequin ch challenge and people were just like frozen wherever they were. Nurses were doing it. Police officers were doing it. Teachers, students were doing it. And that makes me think of the schizophrenic patient when we think about that mannequin challenge okay so what does the nurse have to do to help keep this patient safe what are the nursing interventions well we want to provide a structured safe environment trusting relationship right ask the patient about the hallucinations don't argue with them about their delusions check the client for paranoid delusions because this can increase their risk of violence against others and we want to attempt to focus the conversation on reality-based concepts, okay? So schizophrenia, they have a break in reality. So since we're talking about mental health, we have to talk about stress reduction. So stress reduction, a good book, working out, breathing, regular exercise, meditation, yoga. These are all great things. Time management. So these are things to not only for our patients, but also for ourselves. We can always benefit from these stress reduction methods. Suicide precautions we mentioned before, right? But these are all things that you should keep in mind, right? We have the belt, the razor, no matches, telephone, the suicide contract. It could be known as the suicide contract, the no harm contract, the no kill contract. But basically, they're all 
the same kind of things. Basically, it's a written contract. And no, you can't sue the patient if they violate the contract. But it is a piece of paper that has a um, plan of action if the patient feels like harming themselves. What do they do? Who do they call? What's their support system? What should they do? Who should they reach out to for help? So again, you could hear a call, a no-kill contract, a no-suicide contract, a safety contract, but that's they're all uh, pretty much the same kind of information for your patient. All right, last but not least is sundowning. Sundowning, wow. If you've ever seen a dementia patient during the evening hours and early into the morning, they turn into a nice, sweet patient and then they become a werewolf. Right. And so it's a, a great kind of uh, picture because that's what it feels like sometimes. This is the patient that has to stay by the nursing station because they are just, um, you know, frantic. They're walking around, they're pacing, they may go into other patients' rooms, right? But this is called sundowning syndrome. You have to be familiar with that term. All right, we have talked about a lot of mental health conditions. We are going to end with doing a couple uh, questions, maybe a few questions uh, on the mental health side. And we're going to kind of break it down and talk about therapeutic communication. So let's look at question number one. A nurse is caring for a client who is dying. The client says, my mother died in the hospital, but I did not get there before she died. Which of the following statements should the nurse make? So first of all, this is a positive question. This is something that the nurse should say to the patient, right? So let's see here. Okay, we will call your family in time for them to get here. Well, you don't know, number one, if her family even wants to come, right? And you don't know when she's going to die. Like, you can't make this promise to the patient, right? So that is definitely not correct, okay? This is dismissive. It also gives them false reassurance. We never want to give our patients false reassurance. So I'm crossing A out. B, I wonder if you are fearful from di of dying alone. So this is therapeutic because it lets the patient know, okay, I sense that you have a concern and that you are dying and that no one's here with you. So I kind of like that choice. So I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to cross it off. C, I will make sure a staff member is in your room at all times. Okay, you probably laughed out loud when you read that particular choice because we are barely staffed as it is, although in the NCLEX world, we have perfect staffing, but you cannot ensure that there's going to be someone in the patient's room at all time. You can't, can, you can't promise that. So that is definitely crossing that out. I will tell your family of your concern so that they can be here. Well, that's almost like choice A. And how do you know that the family is not going to be happy when this patient dies? You never know, right? So D is definitely not the right answer. So B is the most therapeutic answer, okay? Because it is verbalizing the patient's implied concerns and we are validating to see if this is a client's concern. Whenever we have mental health questions, we want to use therapeutic communication and always validate the patient's feelings. All right, let's go to question two. A nurse is caring for a young adult who says he is experiencing increased anxiety and an inability to concentrate. Which of the following responses should the nurse make? All right, I'm going to give you a moment to read the choices. Okay, so let's start at the bottom this time. And so we are looking for what is a good thing for this nurse to say? Okay, what is therapeutic? What is going to be helpful to this patient? Okay, and I'm just going to use a different color here. Okay, how long has this been going on? Okay, well, that's not really an open-ended question, is it? Because the patient's going to say, Okay, two weeks, two months, and then that's it. 
We always want to use open-ended kinds of questions and statements so the patient can uh, explain and explore their feelings. Okay. C, why do you think you're so anxious? Here's a tip. Never choose the answer that says why. That's not going to be the right answer because Asking why is non-therapeutic. It puts the patient on the defensive and they're not going to necessarily be able to tell you why. Okay, but never choose the, the answer that says why. Okay, B, have you talked to your parents about this? Wait a minute. This is a young adult. They don't have to talk to their parents about anything. They're over 18 years old. Okay, so that is inappropriate for us to ask because... Again, it's non-therapeutic, and it's implying that they have to tell their parents. They don't. They're an adult. What is the correct answer is A. It sounds like you're having a difficult time. Okay? This is going to be a therapeutic response. It's open-ended. It's empathetic. And it will maybe help that patient feel like they can open up and talk. Okay? So A is the correct choice for that reason. All right, we're going to do one last question, question number three. And it states, a nurse is admitting a client who is in the manic phase of bipolar disorder. Think Kanye West. So the nurse should plan to make which of the following room assignments for the client. So think about what's going on with the manic patient and look at the choices. I'll give you a moment. All right, we are going to start at the bottom. Okay, so what's going to be a good assignment for this manic patient? A seclusion room until the client's activity level becomes more subdued. Wait a minute, we just can't put this patient in a seclusion room, right? Seclusion room is a form of restraint. It's one of the highest forms of restraint. And just because they're in the manic phase, that doesn't mean that they deserve to be in a seclusion room, okay? So we have to put them in the least restrictive setting. And if they're not a danger right now to themselves or others, a seclusion room is inappropriate. So I cross D off. A, a private room close to the nurse's station? No, the nurse's station is super busy. That manic patient does not need any more activity than they already have. They're creating their own level of activity. So that will not be correct. B, a semi-private room with a roommate who has a similar diagnosis. Can you imagine two Kanye West in the room together? Absolutely not, right? That could turn violent very quickly. Not safe. So B, I cross it out. A, is the correct answer. A private room in a quiet location on the unit because this is going to be ideal for them. They may, because they may be overstimulated by the number of people and activities on the unit. And a private room is good because if they need a timeout or if they need to settle down, they have this private room. All right, my nurses, this concludes our session for today. We have had a whirlwind of mental health and a couple questions just so you understand how to kind of think through. And I want you to remember to always think like a nurse.